Okay, we will continue with our study of the book of Hebrews, and today we are continuing with the theme, Christ, our High Priest, particularly the theme, Christ, High Priest of our profession. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Today we will not be putting up any sermon uh, slides on the, uh, the sli on the screen. So please pay attention as much as you can and jot down your notes as quickly as possible. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read together. If you are ready, we shall read this wonderful verse together. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. The book of Hebrews, as I mentioned in my last message, is especially known for its exposition of the doctrine of Christ. And particularly about his priesthood. It has a lot to say about Lord Jesus Christ's priesthood. Now we all know him as our savior. We know him as our king of kings, Lord. Because he saved us, we trust him. And we love his word. And every word that he says is a command to us. And we are privileged to hear his word and obey it. So we call him Lord. He rules over our hearts. But that is not all about Christ. The scripture wants us to know of him also as our priest. Now we started studying it uh, last Lord's Day. We actually began with Hebrews chapter 5. If you remember there, I preached on the topic, Christ our perfect priest. And... Uh, Today we are going to look at a little bit more details. It will continue over the next few weeks. <coughs> now, to <coughs> quickly remind you, excuse me. <coughs> of the things that we have learned in our last study of Christ priesthood, I would like to rem uh, revise with you some of the things that we learn. Now just pay attention very quickly. Within about five minutes I will complete this revision. Firstly, we learn about Christ's priesthood, about the qualification that God expects of a priest. And the, under the qualification of a great priest that Christ is, we learn that he has to become a man to represent Mankind. So Jesus, in order to save us, did not become an angel, but he became a man, so that he might be our high priest. An angel cannot be a priest. He cannot, the angel cannot represent us. Only a man can represent us. So Jesus became a man to be our priest. And not only that he became a man, he was called to be a priest. You know, not any man can become a priest. In the Old Testament time, in the nation of Israel, only those whom God called from the tribe of Levites could enter the service of the priesthood. And likewise, our Lord Jesus was called by God to be our priest. And we noticed from Hebrews chapter 5, uh, particularly verse 10, last Lord's Day when I preached, uh, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Though Jesus was not born in the tribe of Levi, he was born in the tribe of Judah, yet he is a priest in the order of Melchizedek, called by God. And that calling was heard in, on this earth, while Jesus was here on earth, at his baptism. You remember that when he came to John the baptizer? He said, John, permit it. Because John said, I must be baptized by you, not that I baptize you. Jesus said, John, that 
all righteousness may be fulfilled, you better baptize. And John never argued. What was the righteousness they fulfilled by baptism? It is the requirement that God has in his law when a man enters priesthood. And his calling at that time was authenticated by the voice that we heard from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that's what we read in Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, where this, this truth is mentioned. Particularly in verses 4 to 6. So two things we learn about the qualification of Christ. Number one, he is a man. Because he became man. And he was called by God. To represent us. To be our priest. In the order of Melchizedek. The second thing that we learn about his priesthood. Was his function as a priest. Again two important things we learned. Uh, I'm just putting them in a very brief way. The first function that we learn about Christ's priesthood. That he came to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins unto God. And he, he prayed for us. We know how he agonized for us in prayer many times during his earthly journey. And we know one of his classic prayers are recorded in Gospel of John chapter 17, which is normally known as high priestly prayer. And then we also know of him praying in the Garden of Eden. Remember, his sweat was uh, flowing like blood from the wound. He prayed, sorry, did I say Eden? I'm sorry, Garden of Gethsemane. Sometimes when I go fast, I make mistakes. Please forgive me. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus did pray for us. Committing himself to the Lord that he might be our perfect sacrifice. So Jesus did pray for us. For our salvation. And then he offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins. So we read in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. With great respect to God who sent him to this world, he yielded himself to the Lord and then he died for our sins. He was troubled by the, the fact that he will be crucified. That he has to bear the great burden of our sin. That he will be separated in a way to take our punishment. He was separated from God. And so that was so troubling to his heart. He said, Father, if possible, remove this cup. And he prayed in agony for you and me as a priest. In all this, he yielded to God. He never wandered away. Even though he said, if possible, remove this cup. He said, not my will, but thine be done. So as a priest, he was faithful in praying for us and yielding himself to offer a perfect sacrifice for us. That's the first function we learned. The second function we learned was that he was a sympathetic priest. Every priest in the Old Testament was expected to be a sympathetic priest. Why? Firstly, <clears throat> if he is not sympathetic, he would not pray for us. You see, every person who comes before God with a sin offering in the Old Testament time, they come with a broken heart. And if the priest doesn't understand the burden of this sinner who is so broken in heart, and take it all casually, and do not pray passionately for these people, you know, he cannot minister in the right way. And we have a perfect priest in Christ Jesus. He is so full of compassion. And as the scripture says, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Our Lord Jesus was plagued with all kinds of problems in this world. Hatred of the people, all sorts of objection and oppression and persecution. He was in pain as he agonized in his death on the cross. And he suffered all this. So when we go to him in prayer with all our troubles, you know, he will not be disinterested, but rather he will be very compassionate to hear you and to pray on your behalf. So we have a wonderful priest. I'm sure you would appreciate me if I am a loving and compassionate pastor. If I'm very stuck up and you come to me, pastor, can you pray for me? Why ask me to pray? You go and pray. Lah. Don't waste my time. I've got other important things to do. 
Or a little boy comes here and say, Pastor, tomorrow is my exam. Can you pray? Hi, uh, what standard are you in? Primary two. Ah, oh, man, there are people who are taking PhD exams. You go, I pray for him first. No, I can't have this attitude. As a pastor, if I have to show that, how much more a priest? <laughs> uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ, let me tell you, he will never push you away. Whatever be your burden, how big or small, come to him. He will listen to you. So these are things we learned. Now today's lesson. <laughs> I want to put this in perspective so can, we can get on with the rest. Okay, let's now com come to verse 1 of chapter 3. With the setting of the high priestly ministry of Christ, we now look at verse 1 of Hebrews 3, which says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Christ Jesus. And I'm going to particularly focus on the last half. I will make reference to the first half of this verse toward the end of my message. But let's look at what it says right in the middle of this verse. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So I want to firstly address, as we think about Christ, our high priest, our high priest of our profession, that we must contemplate on Christ. We must consider him. Uh, Christians cannot live a life without thinking. You see the scripture says here in verse 1, holy brethren and partakers of the heavenly calling. And these are references to us Christians. Christians are called holy brethren and partakers of the heavenly calling. We are called to be heaven-bound people. We are not hell-bound. We have a heavenly calling. From heaven, we are called to heaven. It's a very special calling. Maybe one of these days I will preach on heavenly calling by itself. There's so much to talk about. But let's remember, we are a very special people in God's sight. Not that we are righteous in ourselves, but because of our great Savior. We are called holy brethren because our sins are washed in the blood of Christ. All are forgiven, so God sees us as a holy people. It's a privilege that we don't deserve, but God graciously gives to us. Amazing, isn't it? We sinners are called holy. Holy brethren. If Christ can call us holy brethren, do we have problem calling one another holy brethren? Sometimes we get very agitated, is it? <laughs> what kind of Christian? Call himself a Christian can look like that, talk like that, act like that. I will never regard him as a Christian. Mind, mind you what you say. You shouldn't do that. Even though one of us fall into sin, we must have graciousness. We may be tough in rebuking them. We may be strong in our words to make the person understand the depth of the sin and the seriousness of it, but we should never forget to consider them as still called by God and do what we can to help them. If God would do that to me, why wouldn't I do that for fellow brethren? So here we should look at one another as holy brethren. Now if we are holy brethren, we better know this privilege is given to us by Christ. So we can, we can never live our Christian life in the best possible way without considering our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain this a little further. The word consider is a command. It's an imperative mood in the Greek text, uh, which means it is your duty to do. Every Christian must contemplate on Christ or consider. Now the word consider in the Greek is katanoeo. Now katanoeo means giving careful attention, giving careful consideration or meditate, contemplate. In other words, you look at a thing in a reflective manner. You don't just have a glance at it and then don't remember. You can't do that with Christ. If you are a true Christian who has received the salvation and help in your life, then every day, every moment, you must contemplate who Christ is. To, 
consider Christ means to behold him as he is. You know, <clears throat> this is not a call to give uh, an opinion about Christ. Or it is not asking you to give a statement about what you think of Christ. No. It is not about your opinion. It is about you discovering who Christ is. It's about you appreciating what really or who really is Christ. It is your duty to find out. It's not enough that you hear what I preach. But you yourself, my dear friend, must take time as a Christian to think who is Jesus to me. A lot of Christians would hear the preacher and go home and don't think about it again. Once they leave the church, it's all about the world. For some, it's all football. Others, it's rugby. Others, it's uh, fashion. Some, for some others, it's the <coughs> investments, stock, <coughs> trade, and all cinemas. Some others, sleep. Then next Sunday, again, oh Christ. And after that, forget about everything, come back again. No! It is your duty, it is commanded that all of God's people will consider him. <coughs> As I said, not simply by a passing glance or giving to him an occasional thought, but by the heart being fully occupied with him. Our hearts must be filled with the knowledge of Christ. We cannot have room for other things in a way that it will push away Christ from us. Nothing should be allowed to take the place of Christ. And nothing should be allowed to, help, uh, to force us to forget or neglect Christ. He must be always in our vision. As sometimes we sing, be thou my vision. He must be our, in our view all the time. Thinking about him. Thinking about the glories of Christ. And so we must pray like we read in Songs of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon thine heart. That's his call to us. You know, dear friends. Our Lord Jesus Christ is so glorious, is so wondrous in his nature, we must think of him. And then if you were to think about what he does for us, the enormous, wondrous, merciful, gracious, loving, and unimaginably wondrous things that the Lord does for us, we, must, we will become even more excited about him. Do you think of his glory? How much did you think of his glory last week? If you are a person who really thinks of Jesus Christ, let me tell you a truth. You will then know that you haven't yet fully grasped all of his glories yet. By God's grace, I've been preaching the word of God for the last 20 years. And I, I have been a student of God's word. In every way, I try my best, though I have fallen sometimes, to stick close to my Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. To know him, to know his word, and to preach him. And that I stand today as I preach this topic about Christ, the high priest, as one who still having known him fully. You know, the great theologian, Apostle Paul, who had so many great revelations concerning Christ, more than anyone in the Christian church, says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, A doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. 
He had so much knowledge about Christ by means of revelation, yet he says, I am not satisfied that there is a lot more about this Savior. I need to find out. For that matter, I count all things but loss. Nothing shall come in between me and my Lord. If the Lord Jesus Christ has stirred your spirit to know him, to preach him, I ask you, what rubbish comes between him and you to stop you from pursuing that? Count it all but lost, but dung. Take them away. Christ is so superior, so wondrous. But many of us, I like what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 8, sorry, Isaiah 1, verse 3. The ox knoweth his honor, and the ass is master's crib, but Israel do not do not know me. My people doth not consider. Animals know who is their master. The cattle will return to the crib. But God's people, now we can say, not just Israel of old, but even ourselves, wander away from him. Worse than beasts. Isn't it sad? I want to say this to the shame of those of us in our congregation who have taken the knowledge of Christ for granted, who think so little about him, but think about the world, about the pursuit of this passing world, about the glories of this perishing world. For the sake of this world, we think little of Christ. Isn't it true that many of us don't even enjoy one hour of prayer in a week with him? Is it not true some of us find it even difficult to come to church for two hours on the Lord's day? Even that is spent in sleeping and yawning and a lot of grumpiness and so on. <laughs> not all, but some of us. Oh, how we should repent of this attitude. Consider him. Think of him. Have you realized that many Christians find their spiritual life rather dull and unexciting because they do not consider Jesus every day? I can tell you, if you love the Lord Jesus and learn to find, learn to uh, think of his glories every day, who he is, how faithful he is about the promises, and what are the things he has undertaken for me, who, who, how does he function in his relationship with me. When I find out these things more and more, oh, life will become exciting, spiritual journey, everything, all exhilarating, nothing is going to stop me, here I go, Let's, uh, the rest all must be behind me. But it is because only occasionally we take a glance at Jesus. Oh, Jesus. All right. And the rest of the time, we think about the world. If you live like that, if Christ is just an afterthought or occasional thought, I tell you, your life will be very miserable as a Christian. That's not what the Lord wants us to be. The Lord wants us to be exciting Christian. The Lord wants us to be excited about his kingdom. The Lord wants us to be excited about everything we do in his name. You know why Gethsemane BP Church has bothered to have all these mission stations and the care of the missionaries and the mission work and even such huge projects which are far beyond us? Do you know why our people sometimes make such great sacrifice, even sacrificing their immediate meal for the support of the missionaries? You know why they do it? Because Christ is greater than the daily meal. He's more glorious. Nothing stands in the way of one's thought about Christ. My dear friends, in order to live your Christian life to the fullest, you need to be fascinated with the glory of Christ. Consider him. <laughs> oh, you may say, Pastor, but look, life is not easy to think about Christ. I got temptations. I got trials. I got serious, insurmountable difficulties. How to fix my eyes upon Christ? Oh, you see, that's your problem. 
you keep thinking about your problems. You think, you think about what others are talking about. You're thinking about difficulties. You're thinking about tomorrow. But what are these things if you think about Christ? Isn't he greater than all these things? Didn't he say you will have tribulations in this world? But believe in me and believe in God and also believe in me. He is a great God. You've got to think of him. That's why we sing that famous hymn of Helen H. Lemel, who's taught us to sing, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When you think of his glory and grace, Oh, the struggles of this world will grow dim. I can tell you, you can have incurable disease and you can praise God and shine for him. You can have lots of financial problems. You don't wait worrying about it. You still praise God. You can have a whole world standing against you and opposing you. And yet you will shout out the name of Jesus. Nothing can put a lid on your excitement as a Christian if you were to consider him day after day. His glories are so great. The book of Hebrews repeatedly encourages the readers to look upon Christ and his glories. Let me give you a couple of instances before I go on to the next point. In Hebrews 12, which is a familiar passage to most of us, verse 2 we read, Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Look unto him. Consider him. Reflect on his greatness. Be filled with his knowledge. Look unto him. He is the author and finisher. There is nothing in between your faith now and then its consummation. But Christ. He is the one who is going to take you from now to the end. To the glories of heaven. In this journey from this earth to heaven. We need him. And he cannot be out of sight. If we always keep him in our sight. And follow him. Man this is going to be exciting. Problems are no problem. Because Christ is with us. The wind may blow. The waves may be strong. But Christ will be with us in our lifeboat. Just look at him. That will satisfy you. That will give you peace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Same chapter of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 3 says this. For consider him that endure such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest he be wearied and faint in your minds. If you don't want to be weary and faint, then you look to Jesus. He himself has faced with all the contradictions, all the problems that sinners brought to him. He knows what it means to be ridiculed. He knows what it means to be persecuted. He knows what it means to die. No problem. Come to him. He will give you the comfort that you need. Hebrews 4.14. <coughs> Hebrews 4.14. Tells us the same truth. Particularly with regard to his high priesthood. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. You see. You, seeing then. Seeing means what? You understand. You appreciate. You contemplate this great fact. That we have a great high priest. That is passed into heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. He has gone ahead of us. And we are just following him. So if he has gone to heaven, he will take us there. Uh, this is a great truth, my dear friends. I hope it will become even more clear to you as I expound the word by God's grace to you from this text. Now, <clears throat> contemplating Christ as the apostle and the high priest of our profession is our duty according to Hebrews 3.1, our text. So come back to Hebrews 3.1 and take a look at it again. This is what God's word tells us. Consider him as the apostle and the high priest of our profession. How can we do this duty? What does it mean? By the way, one more thing, just probably a repetition, but just want to make sure you get this. This duty 
is so urgent and so necessary that no Christian should think of it lightly. If you are negligent of this spiritual duty, as I said, this journey is going to be very, very tough. And you, you don't know how to manage this. Do you remember in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 which we did look into before we were told this. Maybe you can quickly flip back to Hebrews 2 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. You know it is important that though we have learned God's word that we will not take it for granted and say oh, I heard I know this you know. Uh, Jesus is the high priest of course I know it's in Hebrews not good enough the scripture says you we ought to give the more earnest heed we may know it and we must know even more so study it even more you may know the truth that I'm preaching today to a certain extent but that doesn't mean you can now go and sleep if anybody is sleeping wake up okay <laughs> It is time for you to say, Lord, give me the grace to listen and hear. A more earnest attention. Why? If you don't do that, we should let them slip. In other words, these great doctrines will not have its effect on us. It will just be one of those things that we say, ah, I am familiar with this. You know, as the saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. But no Christian doctrine should ever be considered that way. In fact, our familiarity must drive us to get to know it even more. Because there are more things to know about it. it there is no room for contempt when it comes to Christian doctrines, when it comes to the doctrines of Christ. Because he is so superior, so great, so wonderful. Even if all the days of our life is spent in studying and preaching and experiencing the truth of Christ, yet we know, Lord, I need more. That's why we can't get to heaven. That's why Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because when I get to heaven, I will have a fuller knowledge of the things concerning Christ. I will gain him. In this world I live to, for him and die for him. But when I die, I gain it all in the presence of Christ. Forever I shall rejoice in his glory. So dear friends, consider, contemplate on Christ. Now let's fix our thoughts on Jesus. As our high priest and apostle. So now we're going to move one step further. To, on, com to contemplate on Christ as the apostle and the high priest of our profession. Why should we contemplate about Christ? Because, according to this verse, he is the apostle and the high priest of our profession. That's the reason. There's a great reason why you, you must think about Christ. You know him as Savior. Yes, that's good. You must think about that. You know him as Lord. That's good. But you must also think of him as high priest and the apostle. Now, let me, at this point of time, mention to you why the author of Hebrews, at this point of time in this episode, talks about Christ as both the apostle and the high priest. It's quite important for you to know. The reason is this. From chapter 3 to chapter 5, Jesus Christ is compared with two great characters of the Old Testament. Namely, Moses and Aaron. In chapter 3, Christ is compared with Moses. Chapter 5, he compares Christ with Aaron, the high priest, which we studied in my previous message. And Moses is known to the Jews as the one whom God sent as the prophet to deliver Israel out of Egypt. 
so that they might come out and worship God as their Redeemer. So Moses is the sent one, the apostle of the Old Testament, the sent one. The word apostle means sent one. And then Aaron who comes in the later portion of this section of Hebrews, Aaron was the high priest. And so he is starting this whole uh, section of Hebrews 3 to 5 with this grand statement. Consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest. And then he goes on to say why I say that. He is greater than Moses the apostle. He is greater than Aaron the high priest. That's why you have the statement in chapter 3 verse 1. Because he's going to have a long section where Christ will be exalted above the two famous characters that the Jews are familiar with. Moses and Aaron. But at the same time. I like to just mention you know. In chapter 3 you read about Moses the faithful servant of God. Do you know that Moses was not only known as a prophet, he was also known in the Old Testament as a priest. He did sacrifice. He was a unique person in Israel. He sacrificed according to Exodus 24, 6. And he is also referred to as a king. King of Jeshurun in Deuteronomy 33, 5. Moses was a unique person. He was a type of Christ. And here Christ is both the prophet, priest, and king. And it's a very interesting concept here. Theologically, spiritually, the, the, the great depth of this statement, Christ is the apostle and high priest, is so overwhelming. Let me tell you a little bit more about this in way of application. In his work, our Lord Jesus is greater than Moses and Aaron. Moses revealed the truth, but Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth. Aaron sacrificed for the people, but he was not a perfect priest. He had to sacrifice for his own sins. But Christ is the perfect priest who has a perfect sacrifice. He is both the priest and the Lamb of God. He sacrificed himself. So in Christ we have a perfect leader. A perfect captain. To guide us all the way. If Moses was a great leader. He was indeed. How much more our Lord Jesus. Moses walked with the people. From Egypt. All the way to the edge of the promised land. He couldn't enter. But he came all the way there. But let me tell you, this Savior will travel with you the day when you put your trust in him all the way, even through the valley of shadow of death. He will not depart you. He will go with you until you fulfill that heavenly calling by his grace. Moses is dead and gone. Our Lord Jesus today liveth, making intercession as a high priest for us. He lives. Oh, what great savior we have, my dear friends. If Aaron was a sympathetic priest to the people of Israel, today we have in Christ one who is greater than the Aaron, who, are, who is perfectly compassionate to, toward us. And he's a perfect, compassionate redeemer. Now, having said these things, as we contemplate upon the apostle and high priest of our profession. Now I'm going to explain specifically what these two titles mean as far as Christ is concerned. The apostle. Jesus is the apostle. What does that mean? And as I said a while ago, the apostle means the sent one. He is sent by God. Now this concept is so significant in the New Testament. You see, if he was not sent by God, he cannot be the Messiah. 
It is important that we have a savior sent by God. You see, Christianity is very unique and it is not like any other religion. I tell you why. In most religion, you have leaders, whether prophets or semi-gods or whatever, who were pure men who tried to attain some sort of, some sort of uh, glorious wisdom on their own effort. They tried to be holy even though they are sinful. And they tried to cut off from the world and go to a quiet corner and meditate and what they call nirvana or something like that they would attain. But this is not what happened in Christ's case. He was God Son of God, send to us, not as a man trying to become God, or trying to become a supernatural person, but who is supernatural, who is infinite, eternal, perfect, coming down to lift us, who are miserable and wretched sinners, to his glories. So the point that he is the apostle, the perfect one, the son of God, sent from heaven, proves to us he is the savior, the only savior, the only one whom God sent for our redemption. So when I believe in Jesus, I never doubt about my salvation. I am confident because he is the only one God sent. Now, if you were to read the Gospel of John, Jesus himself repeatedly, repeatedly said to his hearers, I am sent my, by my Father. Now, turn your Bibles now. Turn to the Gospel of John. We take a, a few minutes to look at some of those statements by Christ. Firstly, John chapter 3. You should know this. And how important this great title of Christ, the Apostle. John's Gospel, chapter 3. We begin with verse 17. What do you read? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. It's clear. It says God sent his Son. You see that? He is the Apostle. God sent Savior. Now look again in the same chapter, verse 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. You see, he didn't tell you a human thought. We don't want Confucius theology or philosophy to go to heaven. That will not bring you to heaven. Because it's a human thinking. It may be good in certain aspects, but it's not perfect. But we know whatever Jesus has spoken are perfect because he is sent by God with a mission. To reveal God. That's why he's called the word. In John's gospel. He reveals God's truth to us. He speaks God's will to us. So he is sent with a mission. A purpose. With the authority of God. With the proof that he is. The one who can save us. So he whom God has sent. Speak of the words of God. Now turn to chapter 5 of the gospel of John. Verses 36 to 38. Gospel of John chapter 5. Verses 36 to 38. But I have great Sorry, verse 35. He was a burning and a shining light, and he were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. He says, all the miracles that I did is a proof that I am greater than John, the, pre uh, the prophet who preached before him. And you know by the miracles they do that God has sent me. Now look at the next verse. Verse 37. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. He hath neither heard his voice and at any time nor seen his shape. You know how God the Father witnessed that he sent him. Remember the baptism of Christ. God said from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So you see, he did not take it upon himself, or he didn't try to be a savior. He is sent to be our savior by God. You know, the truth goes on. Just take a look at chapter 6, John, verse 29. Jesus answered, 629, and said unto them, This is the work of God, that he believe on him whom he hath sent. You better believe this great truth if you want to be saved. That father sent the son. Look at the same chapter, chapter 6, verse 57. 
As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. You eat Christ by faith. You feed on him. He is our spiritual food. He is the bread of heaven that came. Now why we eat him by faith? Why do we take him? Why we put our entire life on him? Why we live or die by him? Because there is no other whom the Father hath sent. He is the one whom the Father sent. You believe on him. Chapter 7 verse 29. John 7 29. But I know him. For I am from him. And he hath sent me. You see Jesus repeatedly. It goes on. I'm going to stop there. Otherwise we don't have time. But look. You cannot think of Jesus in any other way. Than he hath sent him. To me. This is a great truth. I show you one more verse. Why it is so important. Look at John's gospel chapter 20 verse 21. This is a great truth. Why this is so important to us. John's gospel chapter 20. I'm so excited. Don't blame me for that. He is in my view in all his glory. I thank God for that. Chapter 20 verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father sent me. Even so send I you. Isn't it a great truth for me? You know, at the age of 17, when the Lord called me to be a preacher, I never knew what it is like. Yesterday evening, after preaching in True Life Bible Presbyterian Church Family Fellowship, I was driving back and my wife was with me. She was teaching the children. I preached the adults and on the way back, she asked me, uh, oh no, sorry, not, not that time, the previous day, not, I got it wrong. Previous day, we were traveling together and she asked me this question. How, how did the Lord lead you all this way? And I was wondering, why did she ask this question? And it took me all the way back from the day. And I was so surprised by my wife's curiosity. That why did I come to Singapore? Why did I end up in Gethsemane? And why am I still here? You know, when I was called to be a pastor, I mean, called to be a preacher at the age of 17, I had great dreams of my own to be an aeronautic engineer. But the Lord put it aside. And my heart was so strangely warm, I couldn't think anything. All that excited me before that engineering field all become nothing to me. It all of a sudden, boom, you know, I spent a lot of time reading such books to find out what they are and why I can't just wait to get my hands on all those things and be one of those exciting people in the engineering field. But everything went... When the Lord started to speak to me that I must be a preacher because the laborers are few... So pray that the har Lord of Harvest would send laborers into the field. That was the verse that took my heart and everything changed. I went straight to my dad's room and he was having a nap. I woke him up and said, Dad, I'm not going for engineering. I'm going to serve God. He looked at me and said, are you sure? You're not uh, dreaming? <laughs> because I had only two more weeks to get to my engineering college. Everything was changed. And my father, you know, is a preacher of God's word. He was trained in Faith Theological Seminary in the United States uh, during the time of Dr. Carl McIntyre, the great preacher of 21st Reformation. And he said, son, you go to the college in the States. And he gave me a, a few names of the seminaries, and he wanted me to go to the States. But I was recounting this incident with my wife that night um, that I didn't want to go to America. So my wife asked, why? Why is that you didn't want to go? I said, you see, a lot of people from India who went to study theology in America never preach God's word. They end up making money in America. And my father went there for five years. He never returned. He studied without returning to India. Uh, and he finished his studies and then he returned and continued to be a preacher. And people who went with him never returned. And not only that they returned, they were not full-time serving God, even in America. They were doing other stuff, making money. Occasionally they would preach. And I said, I never want to be that. If America is going to be that kind of temptation, I will just stay in India and study. Then my father said, after some time, okay, I have uh, another suggestion for you. I have a friend in Singapore, Reverend Dr. Timothy Toh. 
we know one another. And I have a prospectus of FEBC. Would you like to take a look? And I look at it and I said, of course, all this conversation in my own language, not in English. <laughs> and uh, I look at it and I said, wow. Uh, then I, when I was looking at the picture, my dad looked over my shoulder and said, you know, it's not an exciting place. It's a very small place. Not like the seminaries in America and just a double story building. And the pastor, will, the principal will walk around with a wooden clock, you know. You call it what? Chakya? Or something like that. <laughs> and uh, it's a very simple place and the principal wear a t-shirt into the class. No uh, full sleeve and tie and coat. He's a very simple man, but a very good college. And you can be sure they will teach you well. My heart just jump out of the ribcage. Say, yes, I will go. I don't want to go to America, but I want to go to Singapore. I don't know anything about Singapore. And I ended up here. And I said, I will never marry a Singaporean. And I married one, uh, as you say, true-blooded Singaporean. <laughs> and all these are all too amazing. I never knew there is a church called Getsemane. It was not in my mind. <laughs> Why? Just as my father sent me, even so send I you. God has a purpose, a definite purpose. This servant of his can never go away from it. He leads. Why do we go all the way to Ethiopia? I'm going on May 10th again. Why? You know, there's one prayer, just as I pray for Philippines, that it will go to every corner in Ethiopia. And I can't wait to see the Bible college being filled with people, people like Brother Engida and Ephraim and Ejigayo and the rest of the brethren there, teaching them and they're going out and preaching the truth and winning souls for Christ. Even though I'm dead today, I'll be happy this will somehow work and go on and there is something done for the Lord's sake. Is it because I am so great it happened? Did I plan all this in India when I was 17 years old? Did I know anything like this would happen? Nothing at all. But it was all undertaken by my apostle who said, just as my father sent me, so sent I you. So my dear friend, my dear church, my dear congregation, in the name of Christ, there is no stopping, but our marching forward. And he will send us to corners that we have never seen, never heard, both in Singapore and the rest of the world. Let us not flinch. Let us not think otherwise. Let us not the devil whisper a, a, a word of doubt into our ears. Cast them all out. Get behind me, Satan. I follow Christ. And let that be true. The second thing that we must learn is that he is the high priest. Bear with me a couple of things that I need to make mention of this. It's very important. You come back and study again next Lord's Day, if the Lord willing. The same truth of high priest of our profession. But let me make this clear to you now. You now have to consider Christ as your high priest of our profession. You see... <clears throat> We have already noticed this. Just turn back to Hebrews chapter 2, the preceding verses, uh, that is verses 17 and 18 of chapter 2. Uh, see what you have there. We did study this, but remind us again. Wherefore in all things it be behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or help them that are tempted. You notice that in verse 17 it says that it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Now who are brethren? You and I. He did not become like an angel, but he became like one of us. Because he already elected us and think of us from heaven as his brethren. 
It is, he didn't think of us as strangers. You know, when, he, when the Lord Jesus came down to this world and lived on his earth, he was thinking of you and me, not only the apostles, but all the Christians who are born again in the world and will be born again in the world in the time to come. Are all were in the mind and he thought of them as his brethren. And he was so happy on this earth that he has come to this world to be a high priest, to, uh, to represent his brethren before God. He was not unhappy about it. He was happy to do his will. You know, this morning we read from Psalm 40. That's a messianic psalm. Would you turn back to Psalm 40? There you know exact spirit of Christ when he was on earth. Turn there, please, quickly. Psalm 40. And th these are wonderful things in the scriptures. You must know how happy Jesus was here on earth, though he was full of troubles. Okay, in Psalm 40, <coughs> you have a wonderful sight of Jesus' heart while he was here on earth. Verse 7 and 8. Then said I... This is a messianic prediction. Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. Or in all the scriptures of the Old Testament, Christ is predicted. So he says, I come. Because it's written in the volume of the book. Verse 8. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And then he goes on to say, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. You know, when Jesus was here on earth, he was so happy. He was delighting himself to suffer for us, to act as our priest, to pray for us. It was his great joy. He never felt sorry that he came down to this world. He was so happy that he was on this earth pleading for us, working out our salvation, and finally laying his, himself on the cross to be our savior. What great brother we have in Christ. And he became our brother and came down to this world and called us brethren and worked toward us as a brother that he might represent us before God. That he may stand before him and plead on our behalf. Even when you fail to pray, he prays for you. Even when you stubbornly walk into sin and ha, I don't want all these things. I don't care about the church. I don't care about the preacher. I don't care about the Bible. I want to do what I want. And then we backslide into the world. He pleads your brother taking upon himself that priesthood and compassionately, sympathetically, he pleads. I know there are brethren in our church who said, to one another, you know, you better remember what pastor has said, how much he has loved us, how much he has cared for us, how much he has done for us. So don't, don't, don't do this to pastor. But my dear friend, it got nothing to do with me. What I do is only a little bit and it's nothing only because God helped me to do something that I do it. But f don't forget what the Lord is doing. That's more important. Forget about me, but don't forget about Christ. He is your best friend. He pleads on your behalf. A merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. And we are told just five more minutes listen to this we are told he is our high priest how high priest of our profession now this is what I want you to take home at the end of this message listen to this don't get distracted the word profession is a compound Greek word in other words two words combined together and it sounds like this Homo logia. Homo means same. Logia comes from the word logos or word. In other words, same word. What is our profession? What is our same word? What does it mean? 
He is the high priest of our profession, our homologia. What is it? Well, let me explain to you. Homologias, same word, means you agree with what is being revealed to you by the one whom God sent. Who is the one whom God sent? Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and life. You as a Christian do not have any other profession or any other path. Your life is never in contradiction to what God has revealed to you. You stand in a gribbon with him. So, homo logia, profession. So, profession doesn't mean I profess to be a Christian, but I take my stand with my Lord. That's our profession. Allegiance to God's word. Allegiance to the one whom God has sent to this world. The truth. The Lord Jesus Christ. That is our profession. So you see, Jesus is not in the business of being a, a, a prophet of God to those who don't want to say what he says. Let me tell you, he is not a prophet, he is not a high priest to those who do not want to listen to him and agree with him. If you come to church, listen to him and go out and live like the world, he is not your prophet, he is not your priest, he has nothing to do with you. Do you follow? Christ, he came to take us to his side, not to push away into the sins of the world, not to say the things of the world, not to sing the song of the world. He called you, he is here calling you what? Brethren, remember the first part of this verse? Holy brethren, you are called with a heavenly calling. Your call is not from the world. It's not an earthly calling. You cannot be distracted by the things of this world. Mind you, heaven bids you. Christ has come to take you under his wings. Fly up to heaven, not to leave you into the perils of this world. He is our brother. He will not let you go. Today he calls you to his side and say, Come to me. My father has sent you, me to this world to take you to myself and teach you to walk in this world in my leadership. And as I prayed to God for you, look, it is not to forget you, but to hold you in my hands. You know, my dear friends, why we reach 500,000 in the work of the Lord? He is our high priest. Because this, this particular project we have is not a worldly investment game. We don't have to take... Oh, no. We don't have to borrow money from there to put in here. You know, and we are not like other churches who borrow money from bank and everybody and then build a big thing and don't know how to pay. We don't serve any master. We only have one master. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. We believe. He provides. He is our high priest. And we say what he wants to say. He, we do what he wants us to do. And he will never ask you to do anything that he will not provide for. He is our God. He is our leader. He says, I send you as I... I am sent by my Father, and God, He undertakes our needs. Oh, how good is my Lord to me. From the day I left my home in India, though I went through many trials, many, many lonely nights, nobody to care for me, my Savior never left me. I did not become your pastor by flying in planes and coming with millions of dollars in my pocket. I abandoned everything for Christ, but he was everything to me. I taught you for the last 20 years from this pulpit, as I believed him to be true. And today I have another opportunity to lift his name. And I will tell you, my young friends, children, teens, youths, serve him if he calls you. He is your apostle. He will go before you and then will, he will lead you there. 
When you say go, it's not like saying get away from me or go and die. No. Go, I will go with you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Lo, I am with you even to the end of the world. That's how the Great Commission ends. Our great high priest, having compassion on us, he will never forget us. Even when we forget him, he is praying for us. And that's why you are here today. Will you not praise him? We will come back and study Hebrews 4. But in conclusion, would you please read with me what we read there. Hebrews chapter 4. And we end today's devotion of God's word. Wonderful as it is, I pray that your heart will consider Christ as he is. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14 to 16. We will come back and study it in detail, but take a look at this. Verse 14 of Hebrews 4, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. You see, we are called with a heavenly calling. He already gone into heaven, passed into heavens. He pa it says he is passed into the heavens. Why plural? Paul himself says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he, ha he knows a man who has gone into third heaven. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. He went through the, the bird, the air, air where the birds fly. He went into the starry heaven. Beyond that, his disciples were looking up. The clouds came down, took him away from the Mount Olive. Up and up and up beyond the stars. He went to the third heaven where God and his angels liveth forever. Where he prepares a mansion for us. He has gone there to tell us he's coming back to take us there. He is our priest. He will bring us there. And he will not forget us in between. He is praying for us as our high priest. So he says there, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. What is our profession? Standing with Christ. Believing what he has revealed to us. Following his way all the way. Let's hold on to our faith. Not because of people. Ah, you know, don't ever say, I'm not going to come to church because nobody, nobody smiled at me. I'm not going to come into church because, you know, people look rather weird. No, 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 no. Whether people look weird, fat or thin or grouchy or smiley, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we look to our Lord Jesus Christ and we hold fast our profession. Because we believe in the truth that Jesus is our Savior. He is our high priest who prays for us. To come into his presence is our great delight. Let us praise him. Let's pray.